All right. Welcome everybody. The, the participant numbers are quickly increasing. We're going to get started in just a couple of moments. Let folks uh, join us on this call on this Wednesday night. We're super grateful for everybody to be here with us. And um, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat if you want to say your name or where you're from and a word to describe how you're doing on this Wednesday, knowing we are in unprecedented times and there's nothing normal about uh, what's happening right now. So folks are welcome to go ahead and introduce themselves if they want. Yep, Jen, with you, Jen. So we'll get started in just a few moments. Yes, Silva. Hi, friends. Very cool. Great. Yeah, we'll probably get started in about three minutes. So if you need to grab your tea or glass of wine or your water, we'll get started in just about three minutes. All right, Canada, wine it is. Okay, very good. Oh, yes. Got some other Atlanta in the house. Very cool. It's going to be, yeah, a heavily Atlanta panel tonight, which is very exciting. All right, mimosas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Glad you're with us, Susan. And everybody, of course. All right, more North Carolina. Got some Southerners on the call tonight. It's always great. Okay. Give us one or two more minutes. Love it, good, yes, Sean, good work that I love is bringing me through. Isn't that right? Okay. Yeah, folks also wanna share a word about how they're doing. We know it's rough out here, friends. So. One day at a time, that's right. Okay, I'm gonna get us started. It's about 8.04 and more folks will be joining us. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Kate Shapiro. I'm the organizing director at the Women's March. I'm here in Atlanta um, and we're really, really, really grateful for folks to be able to join us virtually tonight. We have over 700 people signed up for this webinar tonight um, and we're super grateful to our panelists who I'm gonna introduce in a second for being able to share a small smidge of their brilliance and wisdom um, with us tonight. So what the, where we're going tonight is we're gonna do a little bit of a welcome um, and we're gonna take a poll for folks that are on their computers. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of Women's March's sort of perspective on this moment, but the vast majority of this call will be devoted to hearing from our incredible panelists. We will then do a, a Q and A uh, where we can get to hopefully as many of y'all's questions as possible, and then we'll close out in terms of next steps. Just a couple pieces of housekeeping. One, this call is being recorded, and so the resources that are named, you're welcome to write notes as you want, but all the resources that are named will also be sent out with the recording after this call so that you all will be able to have that. Um, the other piece too is just an introduction to this technology of Zoom webinars. I think many of us have gotten very familiar with them in the last uh, week. And, but just to say, people are welcome to use the chat, but if people have questions for the panel, uh, we ask that you put them in the Q&A. And so if you are on your computer and you go down to the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a little box there that says Q&A. You hit that, you type in your question, and that's gonna give us a way to be able to track people's questions um, because the chat gets a little wild, as it should, with people um, responding and engaging with each other and around the content. 
So just to say, our panelists tonight that we're super excited, this is, this is like live from Atlanta, amazing, brilliant panel. Um, we have Vanessa Faraj, who is the National Organizing Manager for Caring Across Generations. Give them a little wave, Vanessa. There we go. Um, and then we have Marianne Adams, MSW, who's the founder and executive director of Zami Nobla, the National Organizations of Black Lesbians on Aging. I'm gonna give them a wave, Marianne. There we go. And then we have Dr. Edith Biggers, MD, who's a staff physician with the Fulton County, Georgia Board of Health and is a board member of Zami Nobla. So that's our team tonight. And then we've got Vico Alvarez on the, on the back end, making sure everything's moving so, uh, smoothly. And I, again, am, am Kate Shapiro. So coming at you from different places across Atlanta, <laughs> here we are, and Chicago, which is where Vico is. So just to say, we're now gonna do a poll. And so what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be a box that's gonna pop up on your screen. And that's gonna have just a couple of questions. Uh, you're only seeing me, Elizabeth, because I'm talking. So as the other folks are talking, you'll be able to see them and you can also go uh, up to the top right corner of your screen. I believe you know, that might give you some other options um, for seeing, seeing the full panel, but you will be able to see whoever's talking um, as part of the feature. So um, Vico's gonna launch the poll and this is just a way for us to be able to see and share out who's on this call tonight um, so that we can get a little bit of a sense of um, who's with us since we can't all be talking. So you got about 90 seconds I'm gonna give folks to fill out those, uh, those four questions. And Vico, yeah, whenever we get to 90 seconds, trust you to just wrap it and share it. Yeah, if it's not working, why not? I don't know what to tell you, my friends. It's, we appreciate what you submitted. We'll see. It will be up for about 30 more seconds. Yeah, we'll see um, if it works for us. Oh, I can't submit. All right, we'll see. We'll see what we can get. If you scroll down, you should see four questions. If not, it's, you know, charge it to the game and it was probably my fault. So my bad friends, we're also learning this technology. It's not working. But there should be four questions that folks can select and submit. All right. You wanna wrap it Vico then? We'll see where we can go in one hour, Sean. We'll see. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna close mine out. Great. Okay, so we have about 34%, um, no, nobody under 20. We got about 34% are between the ages of 51 and 60. 34% are between the ages of 61 and 70. Um, and about 14% that are between 41 and 50 and everything else besides under 20 is, um, yeah, less than 10%. Nobody over 90, didn't know who we we're gonna have. Um, yeah, 82% are currently providing care in some form for a senior or elder. 53% are currently providing care in some form for a senior and elder or elder as, while also holding down a full-time job. 40, no, 43% are currently providing care and holding down a full-time job, 53% are not. Um, and 83% are not providing care to an elder or senior while also caring for children, but 16% are. 
Okay, all right, 8% up in this gen, great. And 1% doesn't know if they're providing care for seniors and children. Thank you for that. So panelists, take note of your audience as we proceed. I'm gonna share a little tiny bit more in some framing, and then we're gonna get all the way in. But just to say um, that given the existing and increasing threat of the coronavirus, the Women's March understands that many women in our constituency are gonna be feeling overwhelmed, isolated, and unsure of where to turn to for tools and for support, because we're feeling that too. We also know that we need to come together to be able to understand not only the personal, but also the political implications of this moment and how to act together, especially in a time of so social distancing, or as Marianne was saying earlier, physical distancing. So a few things that we know for sure. One is that women are and will remain on the front lines of this pandemic in many ways. With our paid and unpaid labor, we do the majority of caretaking for the sick, the vulnerable, the old, and the young. And as we've already seen this week, when government and business leaders state publicly that some lives, older and disabled lives, are worth sacrificing for the health of our economy, they are exposing two realities we have felt in our guts but have never seen stated so brashly, at least in my 36 years. One, one thing that they're exposing is that many of those in power are more concerned about the health of the stock market or the health of everyday people. And two, that ageism and ableism is an acceptable form of discrimination in this society and largely unchallenged. There are many reasons for this, we believe. One is that our economic system, neoliberalism, equates our human worth with market definitions of productivity and efficiency. And aging and sickness are scary. And that largely as a society, we try not to engage them, but to push that away and hide it. Whatever the reason might be, even if we have felt this or known this to be true, to see it stated so plainly is painful. So we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that, that this hurts. But that we believe that a feminist economy is one that places care and interdependence at the very center of its structures and value systems. We do not judge or calculate anyone's worth based on their earning potential or productivity. I am because you are. With the belief that none of us can live entirely alone, that we need each other. This is our strength and this is our beauty, even if it is seen as a weakness. What this means structurally is creating infrastructure and access to care and health services at every age for every person. And it means valuing the paid and unpaid care work that women, immigrant and black and POC women especially do every day. Because we will all be there someday on one side or both sides of this equation. We know that ability is fleeting and aging is usually the best case scenario. As women we, and feminists, we have been fighting to place care at the center of our economy for hundreds, hundreds of years. From the domestic workers unions of the early 20th century to the wages for housework movement that began in Italy in the 1970s, Google it if you don't know about it, woo! To the domestic worker and caring majority movements right now. This conversation and this fight about our elders is part of that lineage. So what do we do right now? We are here to reject that anyone's life is expendable. All of us are none of us. If Harriet Tubman could stick to her principle that no one gets left behind and actually follow through, then we can do it too. What we can do for our elders and for each other is to say no one gets left behind because we didn't do enough or what we could. And yes, we are just so thrilled to have this exquisite and beautiful and very queer panel uh, with us tonight um, to be able to dive deeper into some of these questions and this broader conversation. So I encourage us all to just take a, take a breath and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, kick off the panel. Again, I wanna remind people as the panel is talking, if there are questions that you have, drop them in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or little box Q&A, pop that out and you can write your questions in there. Okay, so just to start, and I'm gonna have Vanessa answer this and then Mary Ann and then Dr. Biggers or Edith, is can each of you talk a little bit about your work? 
so people know the organization that you're a part of and what you all are doing. Um, and uh, can you then share from your perspective, uh, give us an overview of the landscape around elders or aging adults in this country and what we or they are currently facing with the coronavirus. And the last question, three-parter if you want to get into it, is what is your perspective on this crisis as a feminist? So I'm going to go Vanessa and then Marianne and then Edith. Um, hi everyone, good evening. There's 149 people on this call. This might very well be the um, most populated Zoom call that I've ever been a part of. And I think 84% of people are family caregivers. Um, so I feel like I'm really talking to um, my people and the people that we organize at Caring Across Generations. So it's a real like thrill and honor to be um, on the line with everybody tonight. Um, so Kate, I'm going to try my best to um, answer all those questions. Um, so just to give a little bit of background on Caring Across Generations, uh, we were founded in 2011 by Aijin Pu of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Sarita Gupta, formerly of Jobs with Justice. And we work with older adults, people with disabilities, and paid and unpaid uh, family caregivers to transform our care system in, in this country. Because what we know is that it's not because of any individuals failing that, um, that people are struggling, but it's because our system is in our, the infrastructure in our country is completely inadequate. Um, and we really seek to, um, to address that. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we identify the problem um, in order to talk about sort of how we see the solution to that problem. And Kate, what's my, can you tell me how long I have to talk just so I can kind of respect some sort of time Let's limit here? Give you three minutes. Let's give everybody three, three, three minutes. Three, okay. Four okay. minutes. Four, four minutes. minutes. Okay, we okay, I can do that. Left. We got 40 minutes, so we can do it. Okay. So really quickly, um, we know that domestic work, um, anytime there's been any advances in labor as it relates to workplace protections and minimum wage requirements, domestic workers have been completely left out um, or the last, last ones to cross the finish line. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that the reason that is, is because domestic work is grounded in the legacy of chattel slavery in this country um, and is currently done by black immigrant um, and working class and working class people, primarily women. We also know that home care is not financially accessible. Our society has really focused on institutionalized care as opposed to home care because we know that there's uh, more uh, more money to be made um, in institutionalizing someone as opposed to letting them age with dignity at home if that's something they want and if that's possible. We also know that care work is not good work. And what I mean by that is that um, organizing home care workers into labor unions, um, because they're in the private sphere, is, in order to have you know, fair wages, benefits, and regular schedules, is a really difficult thing to do. Um, and we know that family caregivers, that, that, that family caregivers' labor is not viewed as such and is not compensated as such, and it should be. But we also know that people are living a lot longer and that we need to have the infrastructure to uh, take care of them um, and for the people doing caregiving to be adequately supported. And so we really believe in a federal solution to this problem because we don't wanna end up in a place where we have Medicaid expansion in some states, but not everywhere. Um, Cause we know there are certain states like Southern states where everybody on this panel lives where um, certain protections just won't happen. So caring across generation works to, 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 to let's see, caring across generations works to uh, build long-term supports and services across different states, as well as uh, build a universal family care program that sees that care is something that needs to be addressed across the lifespan. Um, and we're doing that through, like I said, universal family care um, that really seeks to, you know, is a big, bold policy solution that really seeks to address care from birth until the end of life. 
And then one thing that I'll say really quickly before touching on this moment is that um, I think really what makes Caring Across so unique and the reason that I'm really proud to be a part of the team is that we really believe in the power of community organizing. And so what we mean by that is that the folks that we're working with and organizing, um, we know that laws don't happen and policy doesn't sort of get created just because of DC policy advocates. And we know that we need those but we also know that it has to be the will of the people um, to, to push a ball across the finish line. Um, and so I want to just say really quickly, um, and sorry, that was sort of like my quick and dirty sort of introduction to who we are as a campaign. Um, regarding the global pandemic, we know that Donald Trump and his ilk, like the Lieutenant Governor of Texas, believes that seniors should sacrifice themselves for profit. Um, and that is we're just unequivocally against that sadistic notion of sacrificing our loved ones for the bottom line. And so we really think that this crisis has exposed how fragile, and I would say almost non-existent, our healthcare and long-term care system is. Um, and then also, Caring Across Generations is a project of NDWA, as I said. And so we're grounded in the principle and the practice of workers' rights and the rights of domestic workers in particular. So I want to well, and I'm going to let Marianne and Edith talk about the impact this is having on seniors more, but I just want to end by saying that many domestic workers, so nannies, house cleaners, home care workers, have lost their jobs because families are at home or they don't feel safe going to work because they're continually having to risk their own health and safety because they're not actually getting provided with the adequate um, um, adequate, you know, uh, protection they need to protect themselves in this time. So I'm going to stop there and pass the mic uh, to my co-panelists um, who've been in the game far longer than I have. So I have a lot more wisdom to share, I think. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so I'm going to actually start with a quote by Chicago poet Gwendolyn Brooks. And this quote fortifies me every single day. Um, and it's really one that I live by, that I've lived by for a long time. And it's, quote, we are each other's business. Mm -hmm. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's magnitude and burn, end quote. The great Gwendolyn Brooks. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here. And as Vanessa said, I don't think I've been on a Zoom call with 147 people before. Uh, particularly folk who are, are, are caregivers and, 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 and elders and uh, folk who are really, really in the, in the midst of all of this work. <coughs> Just to say a little bit about, it's a little bit of a position I feel back in 2011. Dr. Or, Marianne, your, your audio just got a little bit weird. Try can to you hear me now? Yes. Okay, what about now? Great, perfect. Okay, we are the National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging, uh, centering service, advocacy, and community engagement research. We provide online support and community building via social media for Black lesbians 40 and older living anywhere in the United States. Um, are you having? It's a, it's a, it's just off and on, but not, now you're good. It's just like a little garrison. So we're based in Metro Atlanta. We facilitate in-person discussion groups, organize community-based education forums, um, and we award annual scholarships to Black lesbians and lesbians of color, or even older. Oh, let's see, there's another one. Okay. There it you is. Go to, you know, now, perfect, I'm right there, where you are okay. right now. Okay, all right. Um, we also provide supportive housing services. We're currently renovating a house uh, that will provide accessible, affordable, uh, and supportive services. Uh, hmm. Not sure what's going on. Now you're good. It's like maybe when you're closer. Is that better? Is that better? Yes. The closer okay. you are, I think the better. Okay. All right. So, if, but then you can you see the top of my head if I get closer? That's the problem. I was. Let me push this back. 
I'm sorry. Thanks, what about y'all. That? Is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, because we believe in, in food justice, we are engaged in a grassroots effort to grow our community gardens. Let's go to, maybe let's go to Dr. Biggers for a second. Okay. Well, it's like every time you stop and start again, it's good. But maybe, I don't know, Vico, if you can talk to Marianne while Dr. Biggers goes, and then we can come back to you. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Hopefully you can hear me. Can Perfect. you? Thank you. Okay, good. So I'm a staff physician at the Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness, Board of Health. Fulton County is the largest county in Georgia. Okay. And, uh -oh. okay. So I take care of people living with HIV. I've done so since 1993, I think. So people living with HIV of all ages from 19, I think my oldest patient has been 80. I don't think I have anyone that senior at this point, but usually I think my oldest patient now is 70. Um, more black gay men, men who have sex with men than women, but quite a few women actually. And there are so many parallels between people who are immunocompromised and elders, you know, especially around COVID-19. So being in the health department, every day when my patients come in, I, I start, I've started educating them on COVID-19. And I just want to say a few few words about that, that it's older adults, as well as my patients who are immunocompromised, who are at highest risk for, for, for complications from COVID-19. So we've got to prevent transmission, this aid being in place, staying in. And I know for many of us, I, I have to go to work every day. So I'm on the front lines as a healthcare provider, but certainly many of you are, are at home, either working from home or unfortunately many people have, are, are looking for employment because their industries are, are being compromised by this whole, this apocalypse. Um, there's no vaccine yet. And so this social distancing, the stay in the house as much as possible, I think is very valuable. Um, we have to take care of our own health. You wanna wash your hands frequently with soap and water preferably. Um, and if soap and water are not available, then hand sanitizer, at least 60% alcohol. Cover your coughs, cover your mouth when you sneeze and throw away the tissue and wash your hands. Wash your hands. We're also called upon to make a plan what do we do? What will we do if we get sick? Who do we have to turn to? What do we do about taking care since many of us are caring for, for loved ones, for parents, for children? You know, what do we do if we get sick or if they get sick? Who do we have to turn to? Hello? Oh, goodness. I don't even know if I'm still on. Am I still on? You're perfect. We hear everything you say. You're totally yep. on. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're great. Thank you. Okay. Um, go ahead, please. I'm going to pass the mic back to Mary Ann. Okay. I don't think she's back with us yet, but let's, we can move on and come back to her when she gets back. Oh, okay. Um, the question that she was going to answer next was how to talk about the coronavirus with elders. But we're going to come back to that. But I'm going to kick it to you, Vanessa, around can you recommend any tools or resources for working through anxiety and fear around coronavirus that will help us be a better caretaker for ourselves and others? Yeah, um, this is a question that we've really been grappling with occurring across generations because um, we feel like there's, it's really hard to decipher and discern what the needs are right now because they're so tremendous and ultimately they're structural. Um, but of course the, the, the structural change that we, need, that we need in our society means that we're all, we're all suffering in the meantime. Um, so one, one partnership that I'm really excited about, and this 
Yeah, one partnership that I'm really excited about is we're partnering with the Zen Caregiving Project, which is out of San Francisco. Um, and we're going to be providing um, mindful, mindfulness um, and meditation um, courses over Facebook Live, specifically for caregivers, um, so that, you know, people can have just a, a little bit of tools and reprieve um, about how to combat the frozenness and the anxiety and the helplessness that so many of us are experiencing right now. So that's sort of a humble offering that we have. Um, and we're sort of to be determined when we're going to offer the class. My hope is next week. Um, but folks are welcome to follow us um, on Facebook at Caring Across Generations um, to, to get more information. But that's something that we're gonna be offering our, um, our, our people, just because we know people are really having a hard time just sort of getting by right now. Um, and we want to be able to sort of give people tools that they can access within themselves um, in order um, to sort of make this time um, for there to be a little more spaciousness within all of us. Um, so we have that to offer. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question to you, Edith, and then we'll see. I see Marianne's little box on the screen. I'm going to give her one more second to get settled. And I was wondering in the meantime, Edith, if you could talk about any tips you have on how to be a strong advocate for elders in your life, in your town and or your specialty or one of your specialties, the doctor's office. So how to self-advocate or advocate for your loved ones. Sure, one of the things that I do to advocate is I do a lot of presentations in the community and am certainly more than happy to do that because I, I just believe so much that education is so important for empowerment. I am very beyond distressed to see so much misinformation it's around COVID-19 and, and around HIV specifically since that's my specialty, but also around COVID-19 that has been perpetuated on the internet. And so whenever I get an opportunity to separate fact from fiction, and not just not just fiction, but but let's say lies, just out and out lies, I really want to do that. Oh, okay, there's Marianne. Yeah. I will pass the mic to you. Hi Marianne, you're back, darling. Good I am back. I'm not sure what happened. <clears throat> well, we're glad to have you back. If you want to, if you're down to pick up where you left off, would just love to hear anything about sort of uh, from where you sit and the work that you do. Um, what's your sort of understanding of the landscape right now um, sure. and what we're currently facing with the coronavirus? I'm not really sure if Edith covered this, but I'd like to foreground um, my comments with some statistics that we can get a visual right. of who older adults are in this country and what they're facing. About 50 million adults are, uh, 50 million Americans are 65 and older. That's about one in every seven Americans. Uh, over half are women. And of that half, 34% live alone. So we do know that as women age, living alone increases. Uh, for example, women who are 75 and older, about 50% of them live alone. So if you think about that, that's a huge number. And that means that women who are 75 and older are really, really vulnerable. They're living alone um, and oftentimes uh, with low wealth and, and really living in poverty. Uh, racial and ethnic minorities make up about 11 million of older adults in this country. The median income of older adults is $31,000 for men and $18,000 for women. $18,000 for women and $31,000 for men. Um, and the highest poverty rates were experienced among older Latinx women who lived by themselves. And so the, the the, the, the latest data that we have is from 2017, and we have about 9.6 million 
Americans who are 65 and older in the labor force. They're either actively working or they're seeking work. That's a lot of folk who are vulnerable, who are at the margins, who are engaged in low wealth, and they're working because they have to, not because they want to, but because they have to. They're often taking care of themselves and other loved ones or relatives or extended family members. Um, to say a little bit about LGBT folks, there's not a lot of research about LGBT elders. Um, and the conservative estimates are that there are about 3 million LGBT uh, folks age 55 and older in the US. And of that not, uh, 3 million, about 1.5 million are 65 and older. Um, and so this is gonna double in the next decade uh, as a lot of these folks really, a lot of folks enter retirement age. And unfortunately, due to a lifetime of discrimination, many LGBT uh, people aged without community supports, they're financially insecure and they have really poor health. Uh, they're twice as likely to live alone. They're twice as likely to be single and three to four times less likely to have children. And as we know, many of them are estranged from their biological families. So if you, you take all of that into consideration, you know, we have a really vulnerable group um, that is dealing with a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, uh, a lot of no financial supports in trying to deal with this coronavirus. Um, and, you know, chronic conditions can be difficult to manage at the best of times. But for many LGBT older adults, there are barriers to health care, there's a lack of health insurance, and there's fear of discrimination by doctors. And that really threatens their seeking care and treatment. Um, so the CDC reports that 80% of the deaths in this country are associated with elders. Um, and some parts of the US are really going to take a greater hit than others. Uh, because when we talk about states who have the highest concentration of seniors, Texas leads the nation, followed by Nebraska, Michigan, Montana, Florida, and North Carolina. So we can look to see a great impact of seniors dying from the coronavirus due to health inequities, due to these social determinants, and really due to not having access to medical care and treatment, um, and, and really, quite frankly, being poor. Um, and so what I do also want to mention is within these counties in these states, many of them are rural. <laughs> and we know that in rural areas, you can certainly do physical distancing. But on the other hand, you're further away from healthcare facilities um, and social services, and oftentimes, there's a barrier to transportation. There's a barrier to having anyone take you there. And a lot of people are dealing with shame and stigma and don't really want to reach out for help because again, they've been discriminated against and they don't feel that the healthcare system is welcoming to them. Um, so. Marian, I want to yeah. I, I offer you another question. Sure. If you don't mind. Um, sure. Which is, if you, because everything that you've shared has been super, super helpful, but I'm wondering, because I wanted to make sure that we can get to as much content for our participants as, as possible, is if you could talk about any tips that you have about how to talk about the coronavirus with elders in people's lives. And I'm already seeing some questions here in the chat that's around like, you know, how do you stress to elders the importance of physical distancing? while also not terrifying them. Absolutely. So just a little bit of that, I think would be really helpful. Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that I want to say is that, you know, ageism is really widespread and it's insidious. Um, and it's really, it really has a harmful, harmful effect on the health of older adults. And so I think the way that we speak, the language that we use is extremely important. We need to listen. There is a, a, a huge thread amongst my friends and other people on social media because they are impatient, they are frustrated, they're angry because their parents and older adults will not 
uh, stop going out, uh, would not listen to them. You cannot lecture uh, your parents to older adults. Uh, they resent that. And, you know, we find ourselves with roles reversed and we're talking to them as though they're children when they're our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents. And so, you know, they really start to, and, I, and I've talked to older adults who say they resent this, that they feel like they're resilient. <laughs> they feel like they got this. And many of them are working because they have to. So I think that the first thing to do is to just listen to engage in this conversation, to ask them, why are you going out at 10 o'clock at night? Why are you at the grocery store? Uh, my partner, for example, is upset because her parents are at the grocery store at 10 o'clock at night in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and she's talked to them until she's blue in the face, but they continue to go out and she doesn't understand why. And so the first thing to do is just listen. You know, maybe they're going out late at night because the roads are less populated. They feel safer driving because there are not so many people on the road. Or maybe they're going out because you're buying something for someone else who's working late. Or maybe they're going out because they know the store clerk who's working that shift. Or maybe they're going out because they can get what they need during that time. So I think we just really need to ask questions you know, to try to reason with them. They can understand logic to say, rather than the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm really afraid, you know, start to use I words. I'm afraid that something is going to happen to you. I love you. Uh, I don't know where I would be if, if you contracted the coronavirus. You know, what can we do so that you can hear and understand how dangerous this is? Use language that's simple. You know, we can't use, you know, COVID-19 and, and, you know, use very simple language that people can access and understand. And sometimes it might help to get someone else that they respect to speak with them, like the doctor or the minister or some or the priest or somebody like that. Um, so I, I think those are some ways. I think also to get them to understand this, uh, it might be good to reference some huge things that have happened in the past uh, that they can relate to that had a huge impact on their lives. I think that might be something else that might be uh, productive in terms of having a conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm actually going to ask you one more because we saved a bunch while you were off fixing your internet. And then sure. we're going to go back to uh, Vanessa and Edith just so we can keep our, keep our flow going. But just to, you know, kind of be building off of that, Marianne, uh, we got to hear from Vanessa about something that, their, that her organization is doing in terms of online meditation and support for caregivers, but wondering if there's any uh, sort of tools or resources uh, for working through anxiety and fear about the coronavirus that could help folks be a better caretaker for their self and others. Do you have anything on that? Uh, absolutely, and thank you for that question. We think it's important at Zami Nova to give people factual information, to make sure that we know where the sources are coming, where the information is coming from. And toward that end, we had a webinar on Sunday uh, with a trusted researcher in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who uses accessible language um, and who really made sure that people understood the information we have put that into a Zami Nobler podcast that people can access. And I think they will find it uh, not great information just for themselves, but information they can share and, and information they can sit down with their family members, with their parents or their grandparents and listen to this podcast together and engage each other and ask questions. I think that that would be beneficial. It would be a mutual benefit. We also uh, have a webinar tomorrow on dementia and tips for caregivers because we understand that there are, are many family members who are dealing with members who have dementia and they don't understand how to engage. They don't understand uh, what the behavior looks like. Um, they don't understand that they also need to be able to get care um, and that there are supports out there for them. And so we're going to have that tomorrow uh, with somebody who does a lot of work on dementia. We're also going to have a webinar next week uh, on 
gentle yoga for women 40 and older. All of our webinars are open to anybody. Um, and we're going to do Facebook Live along with this yoga webinar. We will also be doing a webinar next Tuesday on money matters. Uh, and you know, how do you deal with money when you don't have any? I mean, how do you make ends meet? You know, what can you do to really augment uh, your budget? Uh, so we're gonna be having that webinar um, next Tuesday. And we're also going to be doing a webinar on nutrition. We have people now who are cooking who've never cooked before uh, their home. They don't know what goes together, how to cook. So we're gonna have a nutritionist to come on and to present recipes and do some demonstrations and talk about healthy eating. Uh, so those are some of the webinars that we have coming up. Fantastic, thank you. And just to know also, um, uh, Marianne has also created a beautiful resource list that I'm also going to be sharing with folks um, when we send out the recording. Um, Marianne, the Zami Noble's website is Zami Nobla, I believe. Uh, ZamiNobla.org. Yeah. Uh, oh, she wants to know, I need to webinar on solo. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'll um, give that to Kate, and Kate can also pass it on. Yep. Uh, because we would love for you all to join that. Awesome. Yeah, so um, we're gonna come back to you in a minute, Marianne, but that was great. But wanting to hear from Vanessa a little bit more about what work are you doing with family caregivers at this moment? And what structural solutions are you fighting for? Um, first of all, I just wanna give a heartfelt shout out to Marianne and Edith because I have so much appreciation and respect for y'all and am just in these last 47 minutes learning so much from y'all, so just, a lot of love and appreciation for both of you and the work that you're doing. And Marianne, thank you for all those reminders about how we're supposed to talk to and treat the older adults in our lives. Because as you said, they still have agency and are still humans and don't need to be spoken down to. So as the child of two older parents, I, I, I really, I appreciate that reminder. That definitely, um, yeah, I felt that for sure. Um, so I'll say that, you know, we really think this moment is exposing a lot, um, and that as a society, we have to care for the most vulnerable among us and that ultimately, you know, we all are going to need care at some point in our life. Um, and that we're all going to be providing care at some point in our life. And right now it's really showing that we're in fact all caregivers. Um, and that the failings of Donald Trump um, show us that we, of course, and we already know this, but we all deserve better, and that those most oppressed and marginalized in our society most certainly deserve better, um, as they will be um, most impacted um, by this pandemic, as both Edith and Marianne have talked about. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing federally. So we are working to pass, um, to get Congress to fund um, the Universal Family Care Emergency Relief Fund. Um, and that is a fund that will support um, direct care professionals, um, including domestic workers and sandwich generation caregivers. Um, so there are sort of three sort of three sort of populations that we're really trying to um, make sure are impacted by this legislation. The first is people with disabilities and seniors. Um, we really want to use this fund to expand access to home and community-based services um, to anyone who's uninsured or underinsured. Uh, we also want to make sure that direct care professionals and domestic workers are uh, benefit as well. Um, and to ensure that care workers and domestic workers are defined as, as essential personnel um, to increase their wages. Um, and to provide grants for local and national orgs to recruit caregivers um, because there was already a caregiving crisis in our country. And uh, now that this moment is just sort of further exposing that. Um, and also regarding people with disabilities and seniors, uh, we want this fund to also fund home and community-based transition planning um, for those who are, are at high risk or are currently in institutional settings. And we want to provide flexible funds to cover needs such as grocery and meal delivery, because we know caregiving isn't always medical, that sometimes it's about 
having somebody who can mow the lawn or, you know, make sure that somebody can get up and off of the toilet or make sure that somebody can get those groceries. And then we know that sandwich generation caregivers who are getting pulled by, care, by taking care of children, uh, but also pulled because of their parents or elders in their life that they're taking care of, we want to name family caregiving as work um, and ensure that sandwich generation caregivers are defined also as essential p personnel because we believe that the work that is done in the home is, act is labor and should be compensated as such. Um, and that there should be a care, there should be a stipend provided for the caregiving that people are doing, um, and that health insurance should be expanded um, to anybody who's uninsured or underinsured. So we know that these are big, that these might seem, especially at this moment, pie in the sky visions, but we actually believe that we have to demand the impossible, as so many sort of brilliant organizers um, have taught me. And so we really want to invite everybody on this call to join us in creating a culture of care, um, to demand that Congress pass the Universal Family Care Emergency Fund. Um, we have calls approximately every 10 days, national organizing calls with just family caregivers around the country. Um, and we invite you to attend our next call. It's going to be Tuesday, March the 31st at 8 p.m. Um, and I'm going to put my email address in the chat box because um, if you're interested, I would absolutely love um, to make sure that you get all the call-in information because um, we have pretty lively and raucous organizing calls. Um, there's no cold pizza and there's no, there's no cold pizza or cold basement, but you know, um, it'll, still, it'll, still be a, it'll still be a good time. Uh, and no wine. You have to put BYOW. BYOW, Gwinnett. Great. <laughs> I'm going to give Marianne one minute and then we're going to get into the Q&A because there's some repeated questions there. Okay. Mary, I just want to be able to hear if you want to speak to any sort of tips around how to be um, a strong advocate that's not patronizing for elders in your life. <laughs> in your doctor's office. So anything I'm around advocating. Sit sure. You know, I want to say something about this narrative uh, that's at the forefront now about death and sacrifice. Um, I'm really upset about that. I, I think we need to disrupt that on every level that we can. And I, I know that it must be very upsetting to elders to hear that they can be sacrificed and to hear that, you know, by their elected officials is particularly daunting. Um, and in addition to that, you know, many of our grandparents are caring for grandkids. They're caring for great grandkids. And these kids are very social media savvy. They're seeing and hearing this stuff. And they must be frightened to death. They must be very scared. Uh, so I think we should find some ways to have those conversations with our parents and our grandparents, uh, not to add any additional uh, stress uh, our dread, but to, just to sort of manage that in some way, not to, to let that go, um, you know, unspoken, um, because it, 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 it really, to me, every day for older adults, ageism is an everyday challenge, you know, and so I just think that it's something that we, that we just need to disrupt. That's what we can do as advocates. We can certainly disrupt that. Love it. Um, I also want to say something about mutual aid. There are a lot of mutual aid groups that have sprung up all over social media in our communities. You know, and we know that as marginalized folks, we've always engaged in mutual aid with each other. That's been our survival as folks who were never meant to survive. I think I heard someplace that mutual aid today is no replacement for systemic failure. And this is true. So in addition to the mutual aid, we really have to push and, and get in our elected officials' faces and do more toward policy. Um, and Vanessa, we would love to partner with you all. We have an advocacy collective, and that's something that we really want to partner with. I also want to say, and this is hot off the presses, there is now a new organization in Atlanta called Metro Atlanta Lesbian and Trans Housing Alliance. We are partnering together so that we can start to develop policy and practices toward affordable, accessible housing as a lesbian and trans group who says that we don't and cannot work together. 
Uh, so that's something you'll be hearing a lot from in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Great, I'm gonna try to get to two questions. We might go two minutes over, friends, so do what you gotta do. They thought this was a packed agenda. I thought we were gonna be able to hit it, but they were right. Okay. So there is a question here that's echoed a couple times around remote care. So I'm wondering, Edith, if you could speak a little bit about any thoughts that you have about ways that people could support their family members um, that are far away in this time that are older. Sure, remote care, okay. Now, I can, I can answer that on several different levels. Today, I ran across an article on Facebook, and I can certainly find that and give you that information about Medicare and how Medicare now is supporting the idea of telehealth. So that's healthcare. Um, you, you and I have a cell phone, a laptop, something that allows communications both ways, okay? And so between you and your provider, so whether that provider is a doctor, a nurse, nurse practitioner, PA, or licensed clinical social worker, a nutritionist, e-provider can engage with people now and Medicare is going to pay for this. And that, that is certainly something that is totally, totally new. Because prior to very recently, Medicare didn't pay for that. You had to have an in-office visit with a provider for Medicare to pay. So I think that this telehealth is going to become more and more important, especially when we're talking about engaging excuse me, especially when we're talking about engaging folks who are in rural areas, but not just rural areas. Now, when so many people cannot come out of their homes, that's a way to continue medical visits. That can be, that can also be expanded to nursing home facilities or assisted living facilities where the doctor can basically come to the residence or the PA or whomever can come to the residence through telehealth. So I think that that is really important. Um, now, in terms of, I don't know if you were specifically speaking about healthcare providers and reaching across miles, or if you're also talking about, about us visiting loved ones. The question is around, yeah, remote care for parents who are on the other side of the Remote country. care for, oh, okay, um, okay. So if you have one more point on that, that would be great. If not, we can keep going. Just sure, sure. Um, somebody's question popped up, and I think the question was going to be, can I visit my parents? I yep, think no, somebody, great. Do yeah, that somebody, somebody asked that question. Um, First of all, when you see these, these broadcasts that 45 is doing, don't listen to anybody but Dr. Fauci, Anthony Fauci, and Dr. Sanjay Gupta. The conventional wisdom right now is that we should not be visiting anybody, if at all possible. Now, I know that that is not always possible, certainly. You know, the wisdom is we need to stay at home and, and certainly, Certainly, we have to care for our, our elders. We have to care for our children. It's not, if we can find ways to do that so that we don't compromise their health. Because one thing we do know about COVID-19 is that it can, even if you don't have symptoms, we don't know if we have COVID-19 or not because there is such a lack of testing opportunities. So unless you have symptoms, you probably are not going to get a test. So we don't, we, we know that COVID-19 can be transmitted from people who have no symptoms. So that, that becomes a risk. Great. Thank you. I see two other questions here that I'm going to just name that I'm going to ask you, Marianne and Vanessa and Edith to respond to in terms of, um, in the follow-up email. So I just wanna name that I'm seeing some repeated questions here. And then if you all have resources, we'll put those in the follow-up email, right? There's some questions here around like um, how to advocate and engage in sort of 
a variety of assisted living situations. So how to advocate for your loved one who's in assisted living, knowing um, that there's a bunch of different challenges um, that so a lot of those facilities are facing. And so how to advocate. Um, and then there's also a piece here around breaching the subject of death planning with um, family members and loved ones. So I know that we don't have the time to get into all of that. I think that that's really profound and will requires a much broader conversation, but I do want to see if you all, if Marion, if you want to say one thing, we can do that, but. Uh, uh, Ashley, I do. We have um, an advisory board member who is a social worker who has developed some death doula cards. Yeah. And they are great. There are about 20 of them. And they will help you engage in conversations with your parents or grandparents or loved ones. And, and, and so because for some people, it's difficult to have these conversations. But taking out these cards and using them as a way to in, in, enter into these conversations and to these discussions are absolutely amazing. We use them in our Facebook group. And it's really got people to start talking. And so I can, I'll send that information to Kate uh, and that link because these are amazing cars and ways to engage folk. I just wanted to say that about the, how you start having these conversations. Thank you. And I know that there's a couple of other questions that we haven't been able to get to in the chat. Um, but just want to say like, thank you to this panel. You are going to get a hearty, hearty follow-up email. Marianne's already sent me a PDF list of resources as well as um, other resources that have been named over the course of this call. Those are going to be uh, consolidated as well as the recording for this. I want to say one minute about some of the other sort of broader work that the Women's March is doing that's obviously in support and alignment with the sort of specific areas of focus that you all are um, taking on and then we are going to close. But just to name um, that the Women's March is launching a range of initiatives um, over the coming months to be able to address the changing needs of this moment. Um, and that we're gonna be focusing on three different activities. One is harnessing the power of everyday women to hold the powerful, aka corporations and the government accountable in this crisis. So one of the things that we're pushing right now is a bottom up bailout. A uh, petition and asking and of course supporting folks and asking your senators and reps what they're willing to do to protect seniors and vulnerable populations. So if folks want to get on that, they are that link is going to be in the follow up email. The other thing is that we are wanting to, yeah, get our minds right and connect in this time. So we're going to continue to bring you more webinars and information, um, as well as inviting people to be able to host virtual meetups with other Women's March supporters in your area um, so that you all can be better connected to uh, each other and be able to engage around the local particularities of your place, knowing that a lot of different places are real different. That sign up will also be there. And there's also a viral hashtag that's happening right now. I don't even know where it started, but it's called hashtag not dying, the number four Wall Street. And that's a place that we also wanna encourage folks to be able to share your stories, to push back on this narrative that you were talking about, Marianne, that we need to interrupt around who's disposable um, and that those people, that elders and others must sacrifice themselves. And the last thing is that we're also conducting a movement census of sorts uh, to take a better inventory of people's skills, interests, and experiences uh, that we're also gonna hope that folks will wanna contribute to so that we can better network people with each other uh, based on common interests and common cause. So. All of that will also be in the email. So you might have to read that email four or five times to absorb all the goodness in it. Um, but just wanna say, we are super, super grateful again to our beautiful panelists. Come through Atlanta in the house tonight. Ow, ow! Um, and that we, yeah, wish blessings on, on all um, non-religious <laughs> vibes in the whole place. Um, and super grateful for folks to be able to join us um, in this in this space and conversation tonight. So take good care, uh, and we will be in touch. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Thanks, Kate. All right. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Edith. Thank Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, good night, participants. Y'all. Thanks, audience. Thanks, participants. Thank it was great to have you all here with us. All right. Thank you.